As our exclusive coverage continues on drugs in Arizona prisons, today we bring you a sit-down interview with the new Arizona Department of Corrections, Rehabilitation and Reentry Director, Dr. Ryan Thornell. So I want to start off with this role is a big undertaking. Um, the department with previous administrations has been under scrutiny before. Um, the governor has made this a priority. So since being here, you know, what have you learned so far? What have you seen so far? Uh, so far, I'm, I'm taking it all in, number one. Um, it's obviously a large agency uh, within a large state. Um, and to your point, it has a significant number of challenges and has been under intense scrutiny over the last decade or so. Um, really, my role so far has been to come in, see the facilities, um, get a lay of the land in terms of the complex operations, uh, meet the staff on the ground, um, and really hear from people um, about their concerns, um, what their interests are, and really start trying to ch chart a course for where we go as an agency. Um, you know, within the first 60 days, I've been able to identify some strengths of the agency that haven't really been spoken about much, but also the areas that need a lot of attention early on. Um, and so that's really been where my focus is. Um, and you'll see over the next, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, more of that vision and planning coming to fruition um, as we lay out what that course will look like going forward. You, back in Maine, correct me if I'm saying the name wrong, but a prison drug treatment program, correct? You implemented something like that in Maine. Correct. Can you tell me a little bit about that program and what it did and what the results of it were? Absolutely. So uh, I think you're referring to medication assisted treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and in the Northeast, much like Arizona is experiencing right now, uh, the Northeast was ravaged by the opioid epidemic, um, lost a lot of lives, continue to lose a lot of lives to fatal overdoses. And the prison system there, uh, much like we're seeing here in Arizona, um, is no exception to that. And um, it, it's a responsibility of ours having such a significant population, sometimes up to 75% of the population suffering from a substance use disorder and maybe a specific opioid use disorder. If we have a treatment available um, to help them through that uh, disorder and stabilize them and then prepare them for a stronger release into the community, we have an obligation to uh, find a way to make that treatment available to them. Uh, while they're incarcerated in order, again, to, to help them with release uh, back into the community. And so in Maine, um, what we utilized was medication-assisted treatment, which is uh, utilizing uh, medications like buprenorphine, um, naltrexone, and, and methadone to treat opioid use disorder and other substance use disorders um, through a, a safe and secure medication pass, along with counseling and treatment, uh, group treatment services. And what that does is it uh, effectively helps uh, mitigate the impact of substance use disorder on that individual, allows them to be more stabilized in the facility, focus on other programming areas that they uh, need to address, and it also stabilizes their behavior, uh, which reduces incidents uh, and increases safety and security for our facilities, for our staff, and for everybody who's there. Um, and so we were able to do that in Maine in a smaller system, uh, but s similar system with similar dynamics in terms of population dynamics. Um, and uh, that's what we hope to do here in Arizona on a very small scale, uh, but on a rolling scale. Uh, we know that healthcare services are uh, critically in need of support and bolstering, and that's gonna be one element of that. Um, the hope is that it will effectively stabilize the population who needs that level of treatment allow them to focus on uh, programming, reintegration, and then when they continue into the community, they'll be much more stabilized and it'll increase public safety at the end of the day, which is the ultimate goal. So you are planning on implementing a similar program, maybe on a smaller scale, but here in Arizona? Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm planning on developing and implementing uh, medication-assisted treatment where it's needed, um, which is going to be in most of the facilities uh, for our very high-risk populations. And it's also an area that, uh, you know, recent litigation has uh, called out as being necessary. Um, it has really become the standard of care um, for this population, and uh, it's something that we absolutely need to prioritize here in Arizona. And so you say we need to prioritize it here in Arizona. Why? Is it because there's drug use, you know, people are coming into the jails, you know, addicted to drugs? Um, is it drug use with inside the prisons? Um, what, why? 
Uh, for both of those reasons. Uh, we know that the incarcerated population um, has a significantly high rate of drug use and drug addiction. Again, anywhere 60 to 75 percent of the population has a substance use disorder of some sort. Um, and we also know that there's uh, substance use within our facilities. Uh, that's an issue in corrections that we've been battling for decades. Um, and so I, I say it's a priority that we implement treatment like this because if we have a treatment solution to some of these underlying issues, it's our responsible duty to implement that solution um, and hopefully reduce the number of those impacted by substance use disorder, but also reduce the amount of substance use in our facilities. That in turn creates a safer, more secure environment. And you mentioned, you know, there is substance use within the facilities. Is it you know, bad? Is it rampant? Is it something that's of concern? Or is this something that has just kind of always gone on? Um, how, can you give me a little insight of what it looks like? I think that substance use inside correctional facilities has always gone on, not just in Arizona, but in any incarceration setting. Um, again, because of the, the dynamics of the population and the, the percentage of them that is, uh, is addicted. Um, I, so I think here in Arizona, I would characterize it as a concern. Um, I would not characterize it as rampant or um, different than what we see in, in other locations, other jurisdictions. Um, but any use um, creates a potential for safety security concerns, and uh, we need to make sure we're taking steps to mitigate that um, through treatment and other safety security practices. Are you aware of how the drugs are getting, how the prison population is getting access to the drugs while they're incarcerated. Do you, are you aware of how the drugs are getting in? Yes, we know that drugs are trafficked in. Uh, they come in through the mail, um, through different creative ways to send it in that way. We know that it comes in through visitation. Any point of entry into our facilities we know is a vulnerability. Um, and so we take steps to reduce those vulnerabilities um, to every extent that we can. And we're going to continue to uh, find solutions and try out new ideas uh, to continue mitigating that. Um, during my interview with Governor Hobbs, she actually raised concerns about this. I, this happened before your appointment and before you came here, but within, have you heard about what happened at the county jails and a officer was caught trying to smuggle? So the governor actually brought that up to me and, you know, that is a concern. And she said, I don't think that's an isolated incident. And it wouldn't surprise me to find out if it's happening on the state side. So this is a concern for the governor. Are you aware that maybe correctional officers could be bringing it in? Has she raised that concern to you that this is something she's worried about? I'm aware that it's a concern. Um, and it's again, it's always a concern, not just here, not just at the county level, not just at the state level in Arizona. Any point of entry into a facility, um, whether it's staff, volunteer, visitor, mail, what have you, is a vulnerability for us. Um, our goal is to make sure that we reduce those vulnerabilities. And so we put every staff member through, including myself, when I go into facilities, we go through a security process. Um, we have body scanners, we have other uh, security protocols that we all follow. Uh, we have mail scanning procedures um, that we're going to continue to bolster as well. Um, so yes, it's, it's a concern, uh, but it's not one that's isolated to one facility, one location. Um, it's just something that we know we need to address. And we owe it to staff to support them in a manner that addresses that safely and securely, and that's what we're going to do. And that was something similar. You know, the governor said this is a tough job in really supporting correction staff. Um, you talked about implementing new ways and really working to prevent this. Have you had any conversations with Maricopa County Sheriff Paul Pinzone? He mentioned implementing, you know, new scanners to try to combat this. Are these conversations that you guys are having um, or and also elaborate on, you know, how you plan to prevent this or work on it? Yes, yeah, so Sheriff Penzone and I have met uh, and talked one, one time so far in my short time here. Um, we're scheduled to meet uh, more uh, individually and formally um, together in the coming weeks. Um, so that will certainly be a topic of uh, discussion for the, the two of us. But I also know we're already implementing uh, similar uh, body scanners and other um, uh, entry procedures that he's implemented at Maricopa County Jail. Um, and that are considered best practices around the country. And so I'm very confident in the steps that we're taking um, to mitigate the issue and to support staff. Uh, but it's certainly something he and I will be talking about because I'm interested in the lessons that he's learned mm -hmm. uh, locally here um, in his efforts. What are the current, 
I guess, protocols or procedures for entering the jails. Can you tell me um, what those are right now? Yeah, so I mean, just generally speaking, mm -hmm. um, anytime you come into one of the one of our prison complexes, um, you're going to come in through a main security door. Um, typically, there's uh, at least a two door sally port um, sort of entry, meaning one door uh, is closed while another one is open, um, and you will be expected to um, you know empty the contents of your pocket uh, pockets, um, identify anything that could be considered dangerous, hazardous. Um, anything that you're carrying with you passes through a, a scanner. Um, you pass through a metal detector and a scanner. Um, and then if anything alerts, you might be subjected to a pat down or a further search. Very similar to if you go to um, the, the uh, legislature, the executive tower, the airport, anything like those uh, typical security pro protocols is what you're going to pass through um, when you come to one of our facilities. We actually had had a source come to us who worked with inside the Department of Corrections and he had told us, you know, under a previous administration, some of the protocols of how staff were let in and out of the prisons um, had been loosened over time. Um, they used to have to park in a lot um, and then were taken to the facility. Now they were able to just drive directly up to that facility. Um, some of the scanning protocols had been loosened. Are you aware of some of these? And he attributed you know, some more drugs being able to be brought in due to these loosened um, restrictions or protocols. Are you aware of any of these loosening of protocols? I'm aware of, of isolated reports here and there that have come in. Um, there hasn't been any sort of formal presentation to me uh, about any of those. What I do know is that my priority is making sure that the procedures, the practices under my administration are sound. And so what we've been doing already in the first uh, 60 days of being here is making sure that we're on site, um, doing, you know, doing quality assurance checks on our protocols for entry, exit. Um, we do targeted um, searches and, and staff volunteer visitation entry um, passes. And so we're doing, we're taking steps like that at all of our complexes because we don't want to uh, have lax processes. We don't want to have lax procedures. And so that's something that we're prioritizing. I can't speak to what might have happened under past administrations. Yeah. The governor also during my interview when she brought this up, she told me, you know, low staffing levels really make this type of misconduct um, ripe. They make it ripe for this type of misconduct. Can you tell me a little bit about what the staffing currently looks like inside the Department of Corrections? Yeah, staffing is a challenge. Um, again, not just isolated here. Uh, it's a challenge nationwide. Um, focusing here in Arizona is the priority. And uh, what we know is we hover right around a 25% vacancy rate. Um, and, you know, in, in some facilities that's okay because we have some areas that we're not using of the facility and so it doesn't require certain staffing uh, at times. But we have other facilities where that creates a, a strain and a burden on staff. And so I think what the governor may be alluding to is it, you know, any time that you place more burden, more stress, um, um, uh, more workload on a staff member, it just creates potential for safety and security issues. And so our goal is to make sure we have enough staff to safely, securely uh, run the facilities, but also allow staff to have some level of wellness while they're at work, uh, which is critically important to me. Um, in the first 60 days of being here, I know that our staffing numbers have improved slightly. Um, I don't take credit for that. Um, I think it's a coincidence of me coming in. Um, I think it's a result of targeted recruitment and retention efforts that the department has had underway. Um, what, what I can tell you is that we need to make sure our staffing numbers are strong. Um, my goal in doing that is to create an environment that staff want to come to work in, staff feel very valued and a part of, and that they're gaining the education and information and experience that keeps them with us as an agency. I think if we create that environment, we will have retention numbers that drive our staffing levels up. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time, um, but that's critically important. Without staff, without staff that feel valued and feel well at work, we're vulnerable all over the state, and so we need to make sure that we prioritize them. Specifically, how do you plan to get those staffing numbers up? Do you have any specifics? Yeah, I, I just share a couple things. Number one, um, I'm bringing together a group of staff uh, from around the state, different complexes, to really talk about wellness and retention and the factors that matter to them. Um, rather than just hand down a list of five or seven ideas 
of what we need to be doing. I want the ideas, the strategies to be staff driven, uh, what's meaningful and impactful to them. And so that's starting to get underway. Um, and also to have staff involved in the work that we're doing. And so as we start identifying things that we need to do as an agency to move forward, having line staff involved in those conversations uh, critically important to me, but also to make sure that we're providing them with the professional development, the information, education to carry out the work as we go forward. Oftentimes, we hand down mandates, we hand down directives to staff, and we just tell them to carry them out. There's not any buy-in to that. And so it shouldn't surprise us that staff get fed up, leave at higher rates, if we bring them into that conversation, if we help them understand and they help us understand, and then we produce a good policy practice from there, I believe that staff will be much more uh, bought into it and will stick around and actually fulfill the mission of the agency by carrying that policy, that practice out. And so those are just a few ideas. Um, the, other, the other critically important thing is when we're out and about walking and talking through our facilities, which I find one of the best parts of my job, uh, interacting with staff and, and the population, is when they ask us something, when they share an idea with us, or when they um, want us to look into something, it's really important that we follow through on that and that we follow back up with them. Um, a, a lot of times, we miss those opportunities to just engage staff and just help them um, have confidence in the department um, by just simply following through on something we're telling them we're gonna follow through on. And so that's another area that we need to prioritize as an agency to help them feel valued. And it sounds like you really just wanna have a collaborative environment here as well. And I would assume, you know, you said you're effective in implementing, you know, new programs or protocols and you need the staff to be able to do that. Um, so I kinda wanted to pivot back to, you know, implementing that treatment program um, on a smaller scale. So we at KTA are actually, it was in November, um, found out of an overdose that happened inside the Lewis prison. Um, three inmates were involved, two of them were taken to a hospital, they were found unresponsive um, and administered Narcan. It, are overdoses something, I mean, in your time being here, something you've noticed that happens in these prisons? I know you said not just the Arizona, in Arizona, but all over. Drugs, you know, are in prisons. It's not an uncommon thing. Um, but are, are overdoses something that you're aware of that happen here, and do they happen frequently? Uh, overdoses do happen. Um, I would not characterize them as frequently, um, but they do occur. Um, as we spoke about earlier, we do know that there are drugs that get into our facilities. Um, and so we know that uh, the effects of those drugs and one of those effects can be an overdose. Um, so they do occur. Um, you know, I think uh, it, is, it is good that we have Narcan available in our facilities um, so that if we have an overdose, we can reverse that um, so that it does not become a fatal overdose. Um, but yes, they do occur. And when we reached out for the overdose to get confirmation through the department. They told us, you know, Narcan is routinely administered when an inmate is found unresponsive. Um, is that just, why is Narcan administered just when they're unresponsive? Why is CPR not being administered otherwise? Um, can you explain that protocol to me? Yeah, so the, the protocol is really, uh, both of those things are administered. So it, it would not just be Narcan administered and then um, that's it. Um, typically, if there's an unresponsive individual um, in one of our facilities, we would administer Narcan because we do know that drugs are, are uh, apparent in the facilities and do have an effect. Um, and oftentimes it can present as an overdose. Um, and so administering Narcan does not have a negative or a contraindication to some other medical complication. And so it's something that we can do very quickly and safely in case it is an overdose to reverse those effects. Um, and at the same time, we are administering or preparing to administer CPR and other life-saving measures in the event that it's not an overdose, in the event that Narcan is not effective. And so they really go hand in hand as a, as a collective medical response. And so I think it was the day after the Super Bowl, I sat down with Governor Hobbs to you know, talk about the department, talk about your appointment. And when I asked her you know, what pointed you to him, she said, you know, you came super highly recommended and there were so many reasons that she chose you. Can you explain, you know, why you are the right fit for this job and to take on this department? 
Well, I think I bring a number of characters, uh, qualities, and experiences that, that make me unique. Number one is uh, I, I will sit down and talk with any stakeholder, any interested person in corrections um, and about corrections. And uh, you don't find that very often. Um, you know, I am very open to new ideas, new ways of thinking, and I'm not afraid to challenge what you would consider the status quo. And in an environment like Arizona, where there's been you know, significant challenges over the last 10 to 15 years, I think that um, I bring a different perspective to be able to um, challenge what those practices were, bring together the right people um, to problem solve a new way of doing things. And then I think my track record demonstrates that I know how to implement things effectively um, and across a variety of different facilities and, and operations. And so I think that's what I bring here. Um, you know, oftentimes you come into an environment like this and it can be very tense. It can be tense uh, between staff and the population, the community and the agency. Um, it can be tense politically, all of those different dynamics. Um, and I like to think that I bring a, an approach that hopefully mitigates that. Uh, because at the end of the day, I just want to do good corrections. And I think the state of Arizona wants good corrections. And so that's what I hope is, is the end product of, of me being here. In a year from now, where do you want to see this department? What accomplishments do you want it to be made? Um, a year from now, um, you know, I'd like to I'd like to see the agency uh, very collaborative, uh, very engaged with our uh, community stakeholders, our community partners. But I'd really like to see the agency operating in a, a much more uh, confident and grounded manner, uh, really uh, carrying out um, you know day to day corrections in a manner that people would be very proud of feel is, is really best practice corrections uh, with strong staffing levels, strong engagement of staff, um, and just, just something that you know, we all are proud of to say, uh, you know, we do good corrections here. Um, I think once we have that foundation in place, which is going to take some time, potentially the, the, the first year, once we have that in place, we can then start talking about, okay, what innovative ideas make sense? What other things have been successful in other states? Um, what population dynamics do we need to address here in Arizona that we can then build from? Uh, but I would consider that first year a success when we have good foundational corrections happening here and our community partners are engaged with us and uh, really uh, working alongside us and supporting us in that effort. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with me and doing this interview. I know it's a lot to take on and it's only been a few months, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Of course. To catch up on the full series, head to KTAR.com.